We announced our first generation device in December of 2019 at a 10.8 terabit routing piece of silicon. Now in March of 2021, just 15 months later, we now have a total of 10 Cisco Silicon One devices and we're on our third generation device. I had to start with this. I mean, you have to admit, this is an incredible release schedule. Typically, you think about a silicon architecture, you get one new device, maybe two new devices, every sort of 15 months to two years. We're 10 devices, 15 months across three generations. Silicon has always been too complex and expensive for this kind of pace. New release expectations are measured in years, not months. We've all thought so long about how routing and switching silicon works and what is possible and what's not possible. That first launch announcement was filled with unbelievable marketing claims that were being confirmed by customers with actual hardware being used in production. And as we would soon witness, the fulfilled promise of an accelerated release schedule. Now, there are two big stories worth following up on here. The Cisco 8000 series encapsulating multiple advancements, making a good argument for being the start of a new generational series a leapfrog level of changes resulting from the complete rethink around individual components and how they can function better together. Now, there are no hard dividing lines between the Cisco 8000 accomplishments and the Cisco Silicon One chip that enables so much of it. So in this Silicon One backstory, you are going to hear some 8000 series stories, but this particular episode is really about the chip. There is another episode in the works that tries to focus on the 8000 tries. That's not very encouraging. And of course, you'll hear more about the chip again. There you go. As I often have to don my marketing hat and think about how I would cover a launch like this, I really don't think there was much more that could be done. It was a legitimate leap in capabilities. But the real story is how this has been accomplished. The announcement represented a single moment in time, a well-crafted summary there to stand in for years of work, shrouded in secrecy, but now thrust into the public eye. But what really happened and how did they pull it off? If you were to throw technology at a problem to build the biggest, the baddest router or switch device that you can, what would you build? What would technology allow? If we really push on all of the cylinders at the same time, what would happen? <laughs> Welcome to the Explain Nerds podcast. My name is Rob Boyd. Now, for many of us, 2020 was certainly a year of extremes. I was bouncing off the walls while Cisco seems to have been heads down delivering on promises made at the end of 2019. No matter how you spent the last 18 months, it would still be difficult to fully grasp the enormity of what was accomplished and what that now sets up for all of us and for the rest of the industry. So Cisco told us that this was all new silicon, right? It was based on a clean sheet architecture, that it would disrupt much of the commonly accepted wisdom in the industry. Okay, that, that line is starting to get a little bit bold. And I already thought at that point that we were at peak exaggeration, right? Sometime between all the recycled acronyms and, and the fresh adjectives and such that we're always looking for. But this was far from their only dramatic statement. In fact, just to pick a few out, there was programmable and flexible without any performance trade-offs, outpacing Moore's law by an impressive 3X, a 10.8 terabit system using only, get this, 415 watts of power, a 163 times or X improvement in power efficiency. And then another big one, this will change the economics of the internet. Okay, so now that I think is probably the most bold. So they weren't being shy with this at all. And I was starting to get a little bit wary with all this piling on. But as I re-listened and I began to examine the evidence, I realized that hyperbole really can't exist without exaggeration. So the question then became, what if Cisco's not overstating things? I mean, bold marketing claims are fine as long as they're backed up with good engineering proof points. And the best proof point, and I already mentioned this one, but the best proof point is a shipping product. And Cisco had covered that base during the launch. The reality is very real. The feedback that we're getting from our customers is amazing. For those who enjoy going a little further, stay with me. We're going to go behind the curtain to see how it all came together. is the backstory of Cisco Silicon One.
That other voice you've been hearing is Cisco Hardware veteran Rakesh Chopra. He held the title of Distinguished Engineer when he started on Silicon One. He was promoted to Cisco's highest engineering honor, Fellow, at some point before the product launch. Either way, I really enjoyed learning from him. He's been involved from the very point of ideation where they started the whole thing all the way through to now, to current day. And as we started getting into the details, this came up a little bit later, but I wanted to come back and address something that I was a bit confused about, and perhaps you are as well. I want to start with why was Cisco so exuberant about new silicon when they had, as I thought anyway, been doing this for years already? We are a true fabulous semiconductor, okay. which means that uh, we control the IP, we control all of the development, we do the physical layout, we own the tests, we own all of that stuff. We buy wafers directly from uh, wafer manufacturers, but they do the physical manufacturing and stamping it on the wafer. So Cisco is now a fabulous semiconductor company, fab meaning the fabrication, less meaning they're not doing the fabrication, but they're definitely doing something different. Cisco would do the design and the architecture. We'd work with a back-end partner who would do the physical layout and the test and the yield management, and they would work with somebody like TSMC or Samsung or Intel. Now, with Silicon One, there is no intermediary. We are working directly with the fab vendors. That's why I say we are a true fabulous semiconductor. Two reasons it's important. One is if you think about cost structures. If you're going to go out and you're going to sell your silicon to an external company, you can't have a margin stack where you're paying somebody else to do work. You've got to get that cost out to be able to sell it competitively in the market. The second is about control of your own destiny. If you're truly trying to optimize things and truly trying to think broad scope all the way down to each individual tiny engineering choice, you've got to have control over the physical layout. You have to have control over how things are yielding. All of that makes a huge difference in that final optimization. That, that's why we're a true fabulous semiconductor inside of Cisco. We didn't used to do that. We've always built silicon in Cisco, but this is the first time we're really operating as a true fabulous semiconductor. That is probably as brief as one can be on that subject. Silicon takes years of planning and development. This really started probably six or seven years ago at this point now where my boss at the time came to me with a question. If we really push on all of the cylinders at the same time, what would happen? This would have been sometime in the 2014 timeframe. Unlike the many what if conversations I've had with friends over a cold beverage, this was a serious question with a potential for very serious budget. As an engineer, that's like a, a dream cart blanche. There's no guardrails anywhere, which can be scary at times, but is also wonderful at, at the same time. Rakesh was the right person in place at the right moment, now being tasked with a question that might even be considered too broad to really be effective. We approached it in a few different ways. First, we went and looked at every product that Cisco ships, and we looked at every product that our competitors ship, and we looked at where those products would begin to run out of steam, i.e., how many more linear progressions of technology could you have before you hit a wall? At what point can you no longer scale the bandwidth? At what point does it become too expensive to take the next step? I picture graphs on top of graphs, mapping it out and looking for patterns. If you took the biggest routing instance that existed today and their year-on-year -year growth and you plotted that, you get a, a, a nice growth curve which goes off to infinity eventually. And you overlay those two things and what you see when you create that view is that roughly by about 2019, things were gonna run out of steam. So this is somewhat jarring because this was obviously a projection back then to a year in the future that for us now has already passed. I hope you followed that. But to me, it implies that many manufacturers might actually be coasting on previous builds and previous technologies. If we didn't do something very large at Cisco, we weren't gonna be able to continue to meet our customers' demands. And so that kicked off a very large investment in hardware at Cisco. And it's hardware across the spectrum. Everything to do with how we build hardware platforms, we invested in, whether that's memory technologies or PCBs or connectors or heat sinks or system architectures, everything across the spectrum, we started investing in to try and drive that industry forward, to be able to take that next 
bump. No stone unturned. We needed to do something very different than the way we used to build routing and switching silicon. And during this process of understanding what the scope was and, and kicking off these investments is when we ran into the company that we ended up acquiring called Liba Semiconductors. This is a critical point in the backstory. Liba Semiconductors was founded by industry veterans. They're the folks who created Dune Semiconductors, the folks who are responsible for just about every service provider fabric in the world. Cisco had already spent time and money digging for the multiple innovations needed for next generation architecture. I've been in this industry for now 24 years, and I felt that I had a pretty good understanding of what the technology would allow. <laughs> uh -huh. Thought I knew what I was doing. And they came and they pitched what their value proposition was. And that's exactly right. My mind was blown. Fortune favors the prepared mind. It sounded like PowerPoint gobbledygook. It's like the type of thing that some marketing individual would come up with and it had no technical depth to it. To be honest, if it wasn't for who the individuals were, we probably would have just left laughing. But we walked out of that room with my mind spinning and, and I sat down with my boss and we had a conversation, which was basically along the lines, if 80% of what they're saying is true, we, we have to acquire this company. Like it is so different than anything else in the industry. The value proposition was so elegant in its, in its simplicity, but we'd always believed impossible to achieve from a raw technology perspective. Dune Networks had been a privately owned Israeli startup developing switch fabrics before being acquired by Broadcom in 2010. The Jericho DNX line of chips became a significant component in many different routers. It's that same founding team that left Broadcom in 2014 to form Liba Semiconductor. When they left Broadcom, they actually thought that they had basically achieved close to the pinnacle of what you could do from a routing or switching silicon. They figured if they really spent a lot of time on it, they could move the needle by about 10%. Being a startup company and moving the needle by 10% is, let's be honest, it's suicide. So they moved on to a completely different problem. They decided, we're done with routing silicon, we're done with switching silicon. Let's go solve the next big thing in the industry, a distributed memory compute problem. How could you have a bunch of servers in a data center accessing a central memory location and then service all of those. How would you do that efficiently? What silicon architecture would you build around that architecture? And they iterated on that problem for quite a long time. And they eventually came up with what they thought was quite an elegant solution for the problem. And they started building that in silicon. Think about how far along you might be in the development process for something like this. And then suddenly all that work, all that investment that you've made to that point leads you to a light bulb moment, you can see something differently than you saw before, and now you have a choice on whether to act on that. If I take this raw technology that I've just invented and I apply it to the way that you build routing and switching silicon, you can build this silicon in a way that is fundamentally different than anything else that exists in the industry, whether it's switching silicon or routing silicon. You would build the block diagram of it completely different, the way packets move in the thing would be completely different, and you can be on a completely different vector of innovation than anybody else in the industry. They pivoted the company, let's go and build a piece of routing silicon. Liba was now in a position to challenge fundamental assumptions. The nirvana of networking is being able to erase the hard boundaries that have always existed between routing silicon and switching silicon, between fixed form factor boxes, modular line cards, fabric cards, disaggregated chassis. If you have a technology that you can use to unify all of those and build a silicon architecture which can span that entire space, what would that mean from an industry perspective? They realized that was actually an achievable goal. And so they started down that path. Cisco had already made progress toward their goals prior to encountering Liba, but now there was an unexpected path that would accelerate things, open up new possibilities. The more we looked at the technology, the more excited we got. Excited enough to acquire Liba for $320 million in 2016. We ended up marrying the expertise that Cisco has, which is a huge swath of customer knowledge, a huge swath of feature knowledge, a huge swath of silicon knowledge as well, and system knowledge. Marrying that with the raw technology that the folks from Liba had started and all working together to now bring to market Cisco Silicon One. It's been this beautiful marriage between the traditional Cisco 
and the Liba company that we brought in working together to really try and solve the sort of end customer needs. One of the big claims made during the launch of Silicon One was that it would be erasing hard boundaries. I think the terminology routing and switching is bad terminology. When the terms were created, it was a very clear dividing line. Routers would operate on the layer three stack and forward packets based on IPv4 addresses. A switch was, you know what, for a certain type of connectivity, I don't need to do something so complicated. I'm going to look at the layer two header. So I'm going to look at the MAC destination address to forward yeah. packets. And because I'm doing simpler forwarding, I can do it quicker. Or I can do it lower power. Fast forward to today, the terms still exist, but they've sort of evolved in nature. At this point, everybody can do L2, L3, some can do L4 forwarding. What the terms really are shortcuts for now are routers are really designed for large scale, deep buffered, programmable uh, engines that are usually deployed in, in the service provider network, where you're touching hundreds of thousands of end customers all at the same time. So that's your traditional router. A switch is usually within a data center. So you're more confined, smaller, shorter fiber distances, you have control over the entire network topology. It's much more uniform. You don't need large external buffers. You don't need as much scale. Programmability is nice, but not necessarily required. Erasing these boundaries would change the balancing act that's always a part of these engineering trade-offs. The silicon architecture that exists between routing and switching are designed around those fundamental requirements. Switch is optimized for low scale, little programmability, high bandwidth, low power. And a router is optimized around a Swiss army knife, i.e. Yeah. let me forward any type of packet. I want deep buffers, large scale, I can do whatever I want, but I'm gonna pay higher dollars and higher power for that flexibility. And those have been the split that exists in the industry for a while now. This hits on one of the harder things to absorb about what Silicon One can do best of breed or say built for a certain purpose, these tend to be mutually exclusive. The value proposition that we have with Silicon One is we can run the same architecture across your entire network for all of the metrics which matter in this role, whether it's cost or power or scale or programmability or latency. Our goal is to have best of breed while still having that convergence. Interesting. So Silicon One allows you to erase the boundaries between routing and switching. But what's different about Cisco developing this silicon versus another third-party silicon provider? How do third parties build silicon? It means that you're optimizing on hard boundaries. So you can optimize the silicon, you can optimize the optics, and you can optimize the system. With Cisco, we can actually erase all of those boundaries and do cross optimizations across all of those. So as we think about building our silicon, we're actually thinking about how to optimize the final system product, not just the silicon itself. We can actually move the needle in a very significant way in terms of how much more efficient we can make the final solution if we allow optimizations differently than you might do if you weren't thinking at a broader scope. Hard boundaries don't exist as arbitrary distinctions. They exist for a reason. But here's where we can see that Cisco's end-to-end -end view allows them to challenge assumptions around hard boundaries and to create distinctive benefits found within both the silicon and as you'll soon see, a fully operational router like the Cisco 8000. The way that most people think about solving engineering problems is what I would call engineering in isolation. I have this hard thing I'm trying to solve and I'm gonna do everything I can to optimize that one individual thing. Mm -hmm. And you do a great job at, 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 at optimizing that thing. But if you miss the coupling of that engineering choice to another engineering choice, to another engineering choice, to another engineering choice, you might not understand the real ramifications of what you're doing when you zoom all the way out and look at it from the network level, looking at it from the system level, and everything down all the way to that one individual engineering choice. And I think one of the things that we've done very well in the Cisco 8000 and Cisco Silicon One is take a very holistic view. Engineers are great at optimizing point problems, but this stuff is super, super hard and every choice is interrelated. It's not magic. Engineering trade-offs don't suddenly dissolve in the face of better questions. 
but they can be reframed. If I'm trying to solve a very large scale problem, how do I give on individual optimizations to optimize that full solution? We don't think about power in isolation. We don't think about a memory table in isolation. We don't think about a packet processor in isolation or a CERTES in isolation. They are asking better questions. It's what is the problem that we're trying to solve and how do I solve that most efficient? And when you approach it from that thought process or that sort of mental model, it becomes very different in how you solve problems. This is not something every manufacturer can even consider doing. We literally control every piece of technology associated with bringing a product to market, whether it's how you physically design the silicon, how you design the architecture of the silicon, how you design the cooling solution, how you do the power design. All of that is in our confines. Almost feels like optimizing silicon without thinking about silicon. What we're actually asking is how do you optimize the system and how do you optimize the network? It's that sort of mental model of engineering, the global problem rather than the sort of microscopic problem. Solving for these equations creates downstream effects beyond the chip itself. Customers who use our silicon get the benefits of the fact that we have solved the global system problem and not just the silicon problem when they build their own hardware or write their own software on top of it. If you think about other people in the industry who might be building silicon and selling it, they are very focused on just the silicon piece. Maybe it looks great, but when you try and build the system around it, there's a bunch of ramifications as a consequence of what those design choices are. But if you approach it system first, you end up with a very different system at, at the output of that final product. The number of organizations that have this in their wheelhouse is quite small. Outside of Cisco, you wouldn't have that type of conversation because you wouldn't have the visibility, you wouldn't have that knowledge base. Knowing and doing are generally divergent skill sets. If I think about all of the, the packet forwarding semantics, packet forwarding is, is shockingly complex. We oversimplify the fact that a packet comes into a chip and it goes out of the chip on another interface. But in reality, there's a huge amount of decisions that happen on every single packet that need to be processed. And Cisco has an amazing ability because we have this huge reach of contacts to all of these different customers across the industry to really understand the problems that our customers at a network level uh, are trying to solve, which then drives the semantics, the behavior that you actually need to put into silicon or run software on top of your silicon in order to be able to perform that function. So we have this great feedback discussion between folks touching the customer, people writing forwarding code, people writing high-level operating systems, people writing FPGA codes that go next to the ASICs, people who build boards, people who build systems, and the ASIC team to try and figure out how to get something optimally done. It's a good reminder, and I appreciate Rakesh bringing this up. He is the only speaker in this podcast, but he is far from the only one who was involved with making all this come together. And he does a good job of crediting people here because there are quite a few people. We have a huge investment behind Silicon One. When we acquired Leva, we were talking about sort of 50 people working on something like the architecture. We have hundreds and hundreds of people working on the architecture now. It's how we've gone from December of 2019 having one piece of silicon to where we are now in March. We've now just announced our 10th piece of silicon in the family. And that is because we have so many people iterating now on this architecture and building these purpose-built devices, but also architecturally aligned. And that brings us full circle right back to those promises made at the very beginning. That type of delivery schedule is only possible because they fundamentally redesigned the architecture from the ground up to be able to do that. And now, ideally, it appears that they are reaping the fruit of that labor. The Silicon One value proposition targets a subjective best of breed classification for cost, power, scale, programmability, and latency. Not one or two of these, all of them. Welcome to Non Trivial Pursuit, a long game with more than a few trade offs to reconcile. We have long 
well, frankly, since the beginning of the internet, probably dealt with this notion that we're making a fundamental choice when we think about deploying a product. We are trying to decide how flexible versus how efficient do I want that infrastructure to be. A classic trade-off familiar to customers as well. I want to deploy something in my network now, but I don't really know what's going to happen over the next few years. So I'd like a little bit of programmability or flexibility. So as my needs change as a customer, I can evolve to that. The, the problem is to have that choice. I had to give up a huge amount on efficiency. If I'm deploying a 400 gig router at that large piece of silicon, versus a 25.6 terabit switching silicon, the switching silicon is way more efficient, but I've lost all notion of programmability. Silicon One has overcome this boundary. What we've done with Silicon One is we've managed to give you back the notion of programmability, but still having the most efficient silicon on the market. I can eat my cake and still have leftovers. I can swim without getting wet. If, if I were in Germany, I might say I can now dance at two weddings at the same time. Don't worry anymore about, do I need routing scale? Do I need routing buffers? Do I need routing programmability? Or do I need web scale switching efficiency? Do I need web scale switching latency? I want all of those things simultaneously at the same time in one architecture. Flexibility that does not come at the expense of efficiency. It goes back to several sort of low level technical details that we've managed to solve that's never been done before. The culmination of all of those innovations is something that just erases all of these hard boundaries that have existed for so long. As these boundaries get erased, you can start to understand how best of breed metrics are not as distinctive and independent as originally thought. But is this differentiation sustainable? Every other silicon architecture that exists in the industry, regardless of who we're talking about, has scalability limits. They design it at an individual bandwidth point and you can scale it higher and you can scale it lower. And as you get further and further away from that center point, it becomes less and less efficient of an architecture. Generation after generation, they make them a little bit faster or a little bit slower. And as you go faster, the power starts to exponentially increase, the performance starts to drop, and it gets harder and harder to continue that train. That reality is why you see architectures begin to be replaced. A good silicon architecture will last you about 10 years, and then it becomes too long in the tooth to continue to innovate because when you set that architecture up, you are designing it around the realities of technology at the time. Technology, of course, moves, which is great for the industry, but it means 10 years later, all of those architectural choices that you would make today would be quite different than you would have made 10 years ago because you're not dealing with the same constraints. Our mental models must now be updated with new variables centered around what Silicon One makes possible. What we've managed to do with Silicon One is we've created a structure that is really truly fundamentally scalable at its heart. We can scale it up as far as we want and we can scale it down as far as we want. And it's really a business decision in terms of how much we stretch that rubber band, but it is equally efficient at high bandwidth points as low bandwidth points. It is I would argue, the first truly scalable silicon architecture in the industry. Generational cutoff points are not an exact science. And as I look things up, trying to figure this out, I figure I'm too young to care if you say, okay, boomer, but I'm definitely not some lazy millennial either. It turns out I'm what you would call Generation X, which, not that you care, but it does sound kind of cool. But who really decides this stuff? So the actual shipping product built on Cisco Silicon One I believe makes a really compelling argument for being of a new generation, no matter what you call it. Our initial target on the Cisco 8000 was let's build the biggest systems that you possibly can and make those incredibly efficient. What we've added with Silicon One is this notion that we can also build a 1RU pizza box, which is incredibly efficient, vastly more efficient than anybody else can build on the industry. And that is a consequence of the architecture that exists inside of Cisco Silicon One. An architecture that allows Cisco to produce new versions at a higher than expected rate, and they can scale upwards as far as they want. Uh, we can scale down without changing anything underneath. And that reality allows us to easily create faster and faster chips and smaller and smaller chips with very little effort. 10 devices across three generations in only 15 months? This is long past the hypothetical stage. All we're doing is we're modulating some characteristics in the chip in terms of how many slices, how many packet processors, the size of tables, and we just release another device where everybody else is straining against limitations that they have within their architecture to make that next device either faster or slower. 
we can just very easily change those parameters and, and bring another device to market. Cisco committed resources towards new outcomes that leveraged a combination of in-house experience, clean sheet design, and revelatory work from an Israeli startup that ironically credits its latest accomplishments to giving up on the original question. If you crank the lid of the package off and you look inside of it, what you'll see is one piece of silicon where all of the packet processing, all of the certies are, all the smarts of the device are. But within that package, we actually have two high bandwidth memory HBM devices, which provide deep buffers in package. In package. Well, let's think about that. Generally, you find buffers, uh, deep buffers, are going to be external memory. And when you think about driving the efficiency and the bandwidth that we're talking about, you can't get enough bandwidth out of the package to even get to memory anymore. Parallel-based interfaces found in off-the-shelf memory was I.O. constrained a barrier not found with CERTES interfaces. It takes a lot of wires to get the bandwidth to its memory, and you can only fit so many wires on a PCB, you can only get so many wires out of a package. But this was not simply addressed by using serial deserializers between the memory and the main die. CERTES takes a huge amount of power to move data. It sounds good in the fact that you shrink the width of your bus, but now your power's gone way up. Back to those engineering trade-offs, and reframing the question to, what am I actually optimizing for? By pulling it inside of the package, we no longer have a restriction on how many pins we have on a package to escape the memory interface. The shorter the distance that you have to drive an electrical signal, the less power it takes. So just bringing it closer saves power. The shorter the distance is, the higher the speed you can drive that signal. So what we have is a massively parallel high bandwidth interface to memory sitting literally right next to our silicon dock. How often do you get to flip an engineering trade-off on its head and suddenly take advantage of something that was previously considered a drawback? The amount of power that we spend in memory is significantly less for the entire memory than we used to just pay for certies off of an old memory technology. And so it's a massively efficient memory structure that we've built. As interesting as this example is, it's just one part of a much larger, very dynamic equation. Power is one of the most fundamental limiting factors that must be overcome. It's reached the point now where it limits the type of things that we can build from a system level perspective. It now limits the things that our customers can deploy. They're out of power in facilities, they're out of power in rooms, they're out of power in racks. If you can't fit in their power envelope, you just can't deploy the system. So power efficiency addresses more than just the obvious barriers. I think there's an environmental slant to this as well, which is our planet can only produce and consume so much power and CO2 emissions. All of these things together actually create this beautiful marriage of three independent entities all lining up together to create this perfect innovation, a technical requirement, a business requirement, and a moral requirement to sort of innovate in a way that's never happened before. The natural outcomes of a design process that began with power efficiency at its core. How do we design the architecture to truly optimize for power? How are we going to design our network processor to forward our packets in the most power efficient way? How are we physically going to lay that out on the ASIC die to minimize clock distribution? Right, so the packets move the smallest distance from the left side of the die to the right side of the die. How do we create a memory structure so that we're accessing packets and memory data the least amount of times possible to save power? Memory architecture is not independent from these power efficiency equations. For every watt that we generate in our silicon, that power has to be delivered through the printed circuit board. It has to go through a conversion in a point of load power supply. It has to get delivered from the facilities. And then all of this generates heat. Now, what happens with silicon? As it heats up, it actually happens to generate more power. And so there's a feedback loop here. As things heat up, they generate more power, which makes them generate more heat. That heat needs to be removed from the system. And we generally do that by running fans, which contributes to the overall cost of a deployed system. If you run the numbers for every watt that you pull in a piece of silicon, the facility operator is delivering somewhere between 1.7 and 3 watts of power. So there's a huge multiplication effect for every watt that we consume from the silicon. So a watt is not a watt. How you build the physical structure of your package, how you lay out that power on the silicon die, affects how heat transfers through the package, through the heat sinks, and how easy is it to cool that watt that you've generated. 
And so when we think about Silicon One, because we're designing this in consideration of the system impact and the impact to our facility operators, we think about how do we structure the silicon and then structure the package to make it very efficient to cool our devices. All of which gets lost in the marketing jargon, trying to sum it all up with generalizations like total cost of ownership, which seems to fit, kind of, but so oversimplified as to almost be detrimental. The ability to see past the terminology and calculate how a particular design will work for you is paramount. If you take our devices and you compare it to somebody else on the market, what you'll end up finding is even if they have the same power number or we have slightly better power numbers, at the system level, the total power pulled from the wall of that system will be much lower because we've thought about that end-to-end chain of events. And that creates huge benefits for our customers when they think about building systems around it whether that customer happens to be a Cisco hardware engineer or an external customer who happens to be building based on our silicon. The dynamics between power, efficiency, and bandwidth do not correlate as one might expect. Bandwidth is a very good ratio of efficiency when you think about silicon. The higher the bandwidth the chip, chances are the more power efficient it is, the less power it takes per gigabit to send that bandwidth through the chip. One very good way of driving efficiency is actually driving the bandwidth of your chip up. Because if you can't fit anything more in, because it's a single piece of the silicon, you just have to start thinking about the problem differently to get that bandwidth up more. Let's imagine two different pieces of silicon that, for simplicity, require the exact same amount of power. In silicon one, you get 12.8 terabits of bandwidth for that power. In somebody else's, you get 7.2 terabits. And then others have 4.8, 6.4, 3.2, 2.4, all the way down to 400 gig of bandwidth. As you think about trying to build a router out of this device, many people want numbers like 32 by 400 gig of bandwidth. It's a very nice number of ports on the box. It fits nicely. To build a router out of our silicon, you use one device. For everybody else on the market, you have to use a minimum of two devices. Comparable metrics really need to consider power per piece of silicon. And if every piece of silicon is the same power, that means that other people will require 10 times more power for the same band. And you can imagine it drives cost, it drives environmental impacts. There's a huge ripple effect as a consequence of driving that efficiency with one piece of silicon. One silicon, silicon one. So not only is the name not as arbitrary as I originally thought, for anyone else that may have missed kind of the key point, here or perhaps with the entire thing the one really means one architecture true convergence if we wind back in time for a bit and we look at something like the ncs 6000 that cisco shipped a previous generation sort of our biggest core router that was thousands and thousands of chips to get to eight terabits of bandwidth that router has 2308 chips all in a single box well cisco's now done this with one piece of silicon Imagine what that does from a power perspective. 11 kilowatts drops to just 288 watts in a single box. That piece of silicon, that Q200 device, is always going to be a 12.8 terabit piece of silicon. It can never get faster. But you can imagine if you've gotten the cost and the power of 12.8 terabits of bandwidth down to something that fits in a single piece of silicon, you could actually offer that to your customers as a hardware product that has lower bandwidth and software license bandwidth over time, because now the cost structures are completely different. Changing the economics of bandwidth, remember that one? Was one of the most audacious claims we saw in the initial launch. Well, now it's starting to make sense. And whether it's external customers or Cisco building hardware and software around it, how you consume it becomes very different and where you deploy it becomes different, right? Now that you have 12.8 terabits of bandwidth at 288 watts, you can deploy bandwidth into the network that used to be limited to something like 100 gig. So as you get bandwidth everywhere and bandwidth becomes cheaper. Much of the complexity that we build into the network to manage the fact that bandwidth is a scarcity begins to alleviate. As everything begins to simplify, everyone's operations get easier. The consequence of what we've done with Silicon One and what it means to network architectures, the network operators, it's actually very hard to understate what that is going to do from a ramification perspective. We've changed so many of the fundamental rules that we think about how to deploy something like routing bandwidth or web scale switching bandwidth. Those just don't matter once you adopt that Silicon One architecture.
Chasing problems around memory and architecture lead to reframing mental models around the scarcity of bandwidth. Less becomes more. And Silicon One is more than just a name. It's a design fact that brings unexpected gains across the spectrum. Stay with me. Coming up next, how to be a smarter Silicon shopper. Now, I recall press comments from the initial launch that questioned if the speed claims were all that remarkable. When we came out with the first device, the Q100 at 10.8 terabits, some people did say, oh, other people have Deal. devices yeah. like that. If you were to compare it to switching silicon, absolutely correct. There were switching silicon out on the market at 12.8 terabits. We had a piece of routing silicon out there at 10.8 terabits. So there was other switching silicon that was uh, higher bandwidth than our routing piece of silicon. The distinction between fact and fiction can be hard to discern. People play marketing tricks. Everybody wants to be able to go out and say that they have the highest bandwidth chip. It's an easy consumable message. What happens when you don't have the highest bandwidth chip on the market? You begin to play games. The first game is creating oversubscribed devices. So you create a piece of silicon which has a bunch of bandwidth that you can get in and out of the chip, but you can only process a tiny portion of that bandwidth. And you advertise the outside number. I have a Ferrari with a Yugo engine in the middle. I'm still going to call it a Ferrari. And it's a fair game to play because in many networks are oversubscribed. So they're taking the efficiency gain to get higher bandwidth devices. But in reality, if all those ports were running at line rate, things would just fall apart. Creating oversubscribed devices is not the only game to watch out for. If I have a 100 gig e port, am I calling that 100 gig of bandwidth? Or... Am I counting 100 gig of bandwidth in and 100 gig of bandwidth out? So it's 200 gig of bandwidth, the full duplex versus half duplex. So that's the game that is played quite a lot in the industry. For anyone not steeped in the dark arts of the data sheet, there are better ways to arm yourself. What I encourage people to do is take a step back, count the number of Ethernet ports that you connect to your piece of silicon. This becomes a way we can normalize our thinking. If somebody looks at a piece of routing hardware on the market with a single Cisco Silicon One Q200 device, you get 32 by 400 gig E's off of that box. So 32 plug holes on the front, all with one piece of routing silicon. If you go out and look at the market, nobody else even comes close to that reality. Everybody else is playing games and how they think about that number. The good thing about marketing games is at the end of the day, <laughs> reality matters. You see it in the final products that exist. For example, the 8201 is a 32 by 400 gig router sporting a power number of just 288 watts. Go and look at anybody else's routing platforms on the market at 12.8 terabits of bandwidth and take a look what that power number is. I would contend that any other product is massively higher than that. The reality matters at the end, not necessarily how it's spun in various different ways. Cisco had a number of well-known brands speaking to their experience with the early field trials that preceded the launch. When they get it in their labs and they do an A-B comparison to anything else on the market, they can see the value proposition. That's actually one of the most interesting things about this notion of disaggregation. Today, when you think about buying a product in a full system environment, you're getting a piece of silicon. You're getting hardware that that company designed and software that that company designed. And then they're comparing that to silicon that somebody else designed, hardware that somebody else designed, and software that somebody else designed. Yet another reason that fair comparisons can be so challenging. These things may just be part of a larger equation with no easy route for independent inquiry. When you have a disaggregated business model, you have customers who are building two systems in an identical fashion, and they're changing the silicon beneath it. And so you have one piece of hardware with the same OS with one piece of silicon and the exact same thing with another piece of silicon. You can get a true apples to apples comparison between those things yeah. and run real data to say, at the end of the day, how different is the silicon that I'm using from this vendor or this vendor? It actually forces what I would call best of breed. You have to be on the market with absolutely the best silicon for the role that those customers need. Otherwise, you're not going to win any business. We don't tend to think of individual boxes as systems, but it's all relative. A real systems approach recognizes where different subcomponents may be compensating for each other in various ways. Perhaps it's operating software designed to smooth over differences between underlying hardware components. 
we have many different routing products, all unique pieces of silicon. Although they run iOS XR, they all have their nuances in terms of this chip can do that, this chip can do this, this chip has that scale, this one has this buffering. And so you end up with a patchwork of capabilities. And XR does a pretty good job of normalizing that from a user perspective. Hide it, yeah. But at the end of the day, you can still tell what's under the hood. Once you actually converge the bottom layer, everything becomes very easy to deploy and understand. Different points in the network, different customer needs, different price points, all made possible through a variety of silicon. A singular silicon design now showcases just how much time, effort, and cost was always required to emulate a consistent look and feel through a product family. I'll go back to the implication for a customer even buying through Cisco. If they're going to buy, for example, a Cisco 8000 product, we have a whole series of, of products, whether it's the 8100 for the web scale switching or the 8800 big modular boxes or the 8200 fixed box routing platform. All of those behave exactly the same. Bottom-up convergence simplifies customer operations. If they've qualified a gigantic modular box and they've spent a long time getting all the features to work and they have another role that needs lower bandwidth and only needs a 1RU box, go ahead and deploy it. You don't have to requalify it because it's the exact same architecture that you've already deployed. So even within the Cisco 8000 portfolio, the notion that we take this Silicon One architecture and give you Many different sizes, form factors, cost points, all of those things allow you to right-size the deployment uh, like you've never been able to do before. Cisco continues to build devices that target a variety of roles within the network. We started from the service provider core and peering roles. What we've done in the last few months is extending that into service provider aggregation, but we've also gone into the web scale data center, and that's a really big deal. Now we have coverage all the way from the web scale top of rack switch all the way through their entire network into the service provider core peering and aggregation roles. All of this now becomes a unified silicon architecture. Once you converge that lowest piece of silicon, you can build a product around it from a hardware perspective and then reuse it in many different roles. But probably more importantly, you can port the software development kit and the forwarding code once into your operating system and deploy it everywhere. So as an operator like Cisco, that's a huge development benefit. Cisco makes Silicon One available to providers who want to build their own thing. So when they write their software, they can port it once and deploy across their entire network. Their development effort comes way down, but more importantly is the ongoing maintenance of the network. All of a sudden you have a support staff that can troubleshoot your top of rack switch or your peering router or anything in between. You no longer have to have these dedicated people who understand the nuances of this architecture here and the nuances of this architecture. You don't have to build a complex network around it because, oh, that architecture didn't have this feature, so I had to put this box here. This is how convergence creates huge efficiency gains that stretch from development all the way through maintenance and upkeep. It's amazing. <laughs> As an engineer and somebody who gets the privilege of going out talking to customers, one of my favorite things is walking them through what Silicon One is and how it works and watching their eyes get bigger and bigger and their mind getting blown around how this is possible. We've all thought so long about how routing and switching Silicon works and what's possible and what's not possible. When we started this journey a long time ago now, it was just PowerPoint. That's all we had. The question from the other end is, obviously this is gonna be marketing gobbledygook and when reality shows up, it's gonna be completely different. We've now been in full production since December of 2019. The reality is very real. The feedback that we're getting from our customers is amazing. See how that works? This is the kind of change that defines a generation. I've been at Cisco now for almost 24 years, but it's really rare to think about another time at Cisco where a bunch of engineers were chartered and allowed to go in and futz around for five or six years to really rethink and change the way we build products in a fundamental way. I'm incredibly thankful that Cisco was bold enough to make the steps that they did and to allow me to be part of it. It's an amazing number of people across Cisco who've all come together across all the different technology boundaries that exist 
to really make this possible. Cisco had the foresight and conviction to, to stick with trying to do this. We'll enjoy the benefits that the team has managed to do for decades. You don't have to fight the temptation to hold this up as something that just happened at you know a single point in time. But as hopefully you can see here, this is a tree that will continue to bear fruit and, and really illustrates more ways in which boundaries can be erased over time. Puts us just on a completely different trajectory in terms of our innovation and the way that we can scale. The advantages that we have today in the industry is actually going to only increase over time. And that's what makes me most excited, which is, I think we're in an amazing spot now, but when I forward project out next year, two years, three years from now, it's shocking to me what is going to be possible with this architecture. Well, I want to thank you for listening to this. I hope you learned a few things because I learned quite a bit and I'm deeply thankful to the entire team, but for especially Rakesh, of course. The time that we spent going back and forth on this during what has been a perpetual pandemic at this point and lots of life that has happened to both of us during the past year, I'm still working with the rest of the team to create a proper look into the 8000 series and I hope that will come out soon as well. Cisco is doing business much differently these days, and it seems to be working. If you're interested in using this silicon in some way to wrap your own hardware around it, you can do that now. But the 8000 is going to be leading the pack for quite some time. Those engineers have the inside position for extracting the most value out of things, and they, well, they've really done that. You can keep up with me on Twitter, at Rob Boyd. It's three Bs in a row. R-O-B-B-B-O-Y-D. LinkedIn gets a few updates here and there in the old TechWise TV YouTube channel. Should have some new stuff as well since I tend to feed that loyal audience of subscribers that never seems to go away. Love you guys. Let me know if you have any questions, corrections, ideas, or just want to chew the fat. But I thank you again. This has been Inside the Backstory of Cisco Silicon One. Thank you, my fellow explainers. I'm Rob Boyd. Thank you.